like to introduce Gary Edelman, a graduate of Michigan State University and Shippensburg University of Pennsylvania. He's the award-winning author and co-author and editor of 20 books and 50 Civil War articles. He's also the vice president of the Center for Civil War Photography and has been a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg for 26 years. He has conceived and drafted the tents for wayside exhibits in, at 10 battlefields. It has given thousands of battlefield tours at more than 70 American Revolution and Civil War sites. He's lectured at hundreds of locations across the country, including the National Archives, the Library of Congress, and the Smithsonian. He has appeared as a speaker on the BBC, C-SPAN, and the Pennsylvania Cable Network, the American Heroes Channel, and on History, where he was the chief consultant and talking head on the Emmy Award-winning show Gettysburg in 2011, Blood and Glory, the Civil War in Color 2015, and Grant in 2020. He works full-time as the chief historian of the American Battlefield Trust. Please join me in welcoming Gary Neal. Dave, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume I don't need this uh, mic thing. If you can't hear, come a little closer. There are more, uh, more spots up there. So thank you for the nice introduction and for having me again. The last talk I gave before COVID started was in this room with the seats six feet apart, right as we, were, we didn't even know what we were facing. So March of 2020 is about two years ago right now. I'm a huge fan of this museum, so I hope you'll take what the NPR moment to heart. Uh, you know, and those tours, when you are out there with the artifacts, from the battle, it's cooler than it sounds. So, I uh, I love rocks, I love <laughs> boulders, I'm obsessed with them, and you'll probably be convinced of that. So I assembled this talk, and there were 340 slides. And I can't get through that many in, in 45 minutes, so I cut it by more than half, and we still have a lot to cover. So who knows where we'll end up, but we'll just get started. So you know the Battle of Gettysburg last three days. I think you also know uh, that on the first day they fought north and west of town, on the first day fighting, on the second day they fought mostly on the flanks, but also in the center uh, a little bit. And on the third day, of course, they're gonna fight back along Culp's Hill um, and fight in the center as well. And that's the Battle of Gettysburg, right? Now, when you look around the battlefield, however, you see things like this. And part of the most famous panorama ever taken of Gettysburg, I don't see any rocks anywhere around here. And in fact, most of the battlefield, you don't see many boulders around, laying around at all. In fact, if you look at this LIDAR, and LIDAR is one of the coolest things that ever happened, satellite imagery that shows you elevation, you can clearly see ridges and whatnot, um, but you're really not seeing the craggy hills, you know, that are gonna end up uh, resulting from that which uh, produces the boulder strewn terrain. But when you start to look toward the east and a little bit more toward the south, you see, um, you know, the round tops, uh, where am I, round tops peeking up over there. You can see Culp's Hill and Powers Hill up in this. You just see it's a much more, there's Culp's Hill actually, a much more craggy terrain. It's almost like something happened that made uh, the uh, sort of rocks appear on that side of the battlefield, and that's exactly what happened. The rocks on the battlefield are um, very similar to granite. They are not uh, glacial, they are volcanic rocks, very similar to granite called diabase. And they were formed kind of when the South Mountains were formed and everything shifted around and a bunch of magma came up through the ground and then the soil eroded away and the magma hardened and the rocks tumbled down to where they are. And that sill that was created called the Gettysburg Sill happens to run on a diagonal through that part of Pennsylvania and not far from here as a matter of fact. And that is why we have rocks on one side of it at the Round Top and Devil's Den and over near Culp's Hill, but hardly anywhere else. It's a pretty thin sill, less than a mile wide and 1,800 feet deep, and that's what produces the rocks. In fact, one geologist said the three-day battle of Gettysburg is merely an attempt of the Confederates to drive the Union Army away from the diabase outcroppings of the Gettysburg Sill. <laughs> because that's really, that's pretty cool. That's really what the battle of Gettysburg is. When you look from Little Round Top and you look off to the left, this is a Matthew Brady view from July of 1863, you can see, or you can't see, very many boulders. Uh, you can go up there today and see a pretty similar scene. Uh, I was rushing, so I didn't get all my then and now perfectly, but they're close enough. No rocks over there. But you know, if those trees were all properly gone and you zoomed in on this section here, oh man, you're going to start to see that there are thousands of rocks in this little area, as well as paths 
massive trail from the artillery and the wagons just fighting, you know, the Battle of Gettysburg, something like 12 days before this. So a really cool shot. And if you're a big enough loser, you can go out and find that rock. <laughs> this rock and that rock and this one uh, has a name called the Big Rock. It took me a long time to think about it, okay? And I'll talk about named rocks um, a little bit later. If you look at this section on a map, this is what you see. Some of the early maps done in the 1860s and 1870s endeavor to not only show wood lines or the type of fence, you see a split rail fence there, a posted rail fence there, you see stone walls on them. Some of them also attempted, namely this one, the Warren map, attempted to get individual boulders on the battlefield, and that's what that section looked like that I was just showing you. So you can look around and clearly see where today, you know, from the air or from the battlefield, what it is. So thank you uh, for joining us today. I hope you really have enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot that one was coming in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the fighting at three different places, Devil's Den, Little Round Top, and Culp's Hill. There are other rocky areas to be sure, but these are the bulwarks. These are the tall hills where the rocks are most, most prolific. There are a lot of rocks on Powers Hill, Gettysburg's sort of fourth and forgotten hill besides Cemetery Hill as well. Um, but, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of close, there's no close up fighting on it, it's just an artillery position. So I'll kind of skip that one. So for the main fighting on the south end of the battlefield, this is what the Confederates saw, an incredible early 1890s view from basically where Law's Brigade Monument is, from the south end of the battlefield, looking directly toward Big Round Top and Little Round Top. You can actually see Devil's Den peeking up over the trees over there. Uh, it looks like this today. Um, you can still see the slider farm out in front of the Round Tops over there. And the Confederate soldiers are going to launch a massive attack of troops you've heard of. The uh, Texans and Arkansans under Robertson, the Alabamians under Law. You're going to have uh, two brigades of Georgians under Anderson and, and Benning. And we're not going to get into too much detail about all that, but they're going to traverse this ground. Some of the Alabamians going all the way to the top of Big Round Top before going down the other side to attack Little Round Top from that side. The ones going more directly in will end up at Devil's Den, that you can see a little bit of right over there. Now, it's tough to show battle action on a map when you're not oriented and at the place. So, you know, you can look at the map, or if you'd like, you could say, okay, this, the, the audience here is the rocky bulwark of Devil's Den. And if that's the case, you know, only several regiments are going to co-mingle and end up fighting here. And you're going to have Texans and Arkansans coming over here. That's the third Arkansas and uh, the, the first Texas coming in here. And then there's just a massive gap over here until you're going to have other soldiers arriving in this direction. To sort of fill that gap by accident or on purpose, uh, General Law, commanding the Alabamians, sent the 44th and 48th Alabama in this direction right over here, right into the rocks of Devil's Den there, okay? Who could fight through those rocks, of course? So they're gonna split, they're gonna co-mingle, they're gonna have to engage in fighting around Devil's Den in a way that they weren't used to. Ultimately, uh, the Union will actually, the Confederates will actually make some gains. So what I was just describing was a lot of this. Here come the Alabamians splitting around. By the way, everything you're seeing here is taking place in about an hour. Okay, I mean, we're talking about some really detailed stuff. So the Confederates are actually going to capture the summit of Devil's Den, fall back. The Union will recapture the top, uh, you know, pushing the Confederates off. And then more Confederates under Henry L. Benning show up. I don't expect you to be tested on this later or anything, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. The Texans and Arkansans, remember, they're over there coming in this direction. Uh, they are going to be out flying because you've got Pennsylvania, Indiana, and New York soldiers going to get around them there. The Arkansans get bogged down, the Texans are going to really uh, start to fall back when the 124th New York, the smallest regiment in the Union Army in that area, is going to attack into the Texans, okay? Um, there's gonna be fighting at places like this. We call this the Fortress Rock. There's probably four of us that call us that, that call it that. <laughs> it's really hard to get names to stick. This is one of the more obscure locations on the battlefield. Anybody in this room ever been there? Couple? There we go. Okay, we know it. it's like the nerd corner. <laughs> over, over, over there, I mean that as a compliment. So this is a fortress rock. You can actually see uh, a dead Confederate soldier there with a prop gun next to him. Prop gun, real dead soldier. Maybe some, some Confederate soldier, probably an aid station or something, tried to get some sort of shield from the fire over there. Short, in short, it's right at the base of the triangle field. You can still see that exact place today. I'll go back so you can take another look there. I mean, everything's still there. Of course, one of the best things about rocks and boulders is our ability to go back and say, this happened exactly right here. It's a lot harder when you don't have uh, boulders in the photograph. 
So by the way, that rock was sitting right about right there. In fact, I drew it on this map here in, in our Death of Den book. I'll talk about that later, of course. The Texans fall back through that area. The 124th New York charge into them. But notice when they do that, uh-oh, here comes the 44th Alabama. Okay? Now you can see only half of the 44th is going up, and the other half of the 44th is going that way. Why? Because of the massive rock ledge of Devil's Den. You couldn't fight through it. You had to go around it, right? Um, this is what it looks like. I mean, imagine trying to send a, a, a line of troops into that. I mean, they couldn't even climb it, let alone keep their formation and get through it. So they're going to split when they go around it. Now, back when I had a lot of time on my hands, I used to draw maps with individual dots for individual troops. Uh, my life isn't quite like that anymore. But you can see that, I mean, you can imagine how chaotic it must have been to split your whole regiment in half while you're going over smaller rocks and, and intermittent boulders, the Confederates wrote about this. They said it increased the difficulty of their advance fourfold. Rocks were the size of a ball. They were the size of a small house. And if there's a rock in front of you, you climb over it if you can. If there's a thorn bush in front of you, you march through it. And if not, you gotta get out of line. That slows you down. You got enemy snipe, snipers and sharpshooters plunging artillery fire coming in on you. Imagine trying to keep a straight line. I give a lot of tours. There's adults can't even keep a straight line on a road when cars are about to run them over. Okay, so you know, it's hard to imagine. So when I would draw these maps, I always try to imagine the moment of going around something. Here's one of the dot maps I made for something around Lee's headquarters. You can see that's the Lutheran Seminary there, and as Perrin's South Carolinians swung around it, they had to go right around the building. So all these troops are trying to catch up to those troops and whatnot. All I'm trying to illustrate is when you're fighting in rocky terrain, you know, I'm obsessed with Devil's Den, but it is not something that troops enjoy doing, okay? It's not cool to fight in a place where you're not trained to fight there, and I'm sure today's soldiers would feel exactly the same way. The left half of the 44th Alabama, this is exactly where they're going. They're going up near the triangle field that you can see some of right here. That's that open area right there. Uh, the, uh, a rock I'm going to show you shortly is actually this one. And here's where the 44th Alabama charged in and hit the 124th New York. Again, those are the New Yorkers going charging down that field into the Texans. In other words, for my description here, they're going that way. And right as they're going that way, here comes the 44th Alabama, terribly flanking. Uh, the uh, 124th New York and, and many men in the left company, B company, for the real nerds over there, uh, uh, wrote about how terribly they were flanked. That rock I just pointed out is a famous rock. It's where this soldier was photographed in depth four times before Alexander Gardner and his crew, in a flash of creative excitement, picked him up and moved him to another location. The only known instance of that happening during the Civil War. Of course, that boulder's still there, and no matter how well I know the place, it's really hard to get these things just perfect. Then and now is not easy to do. You also see that while I compliment the Park Service all the time for the great work they do in clearing trees, they should have left a few trees right on top of that knoll. They sort of did it over there, but it looks like there should be a few trees right there. So I'll nitpick for them. <laughs> While they're charging down uh, into that triangular field, uh, one of the guys, Captain Isaac Nichols, Company G, 124th New York, the regiment on which the Red Badge of Courage was probably based. Stephen Crane talked to those guys. We think that it's based upon that particular unit. And he fell at the furthest advance of the point, okay? They lost their colonel. Their lieutenant colonel was wounded. Their major was killed as well. That's Ellis and Cromwell. I'll, I'll mention them a little bit later. Um, but he was at the furthest point of the advance. And two men went and tried to get him out from where he was wedged between two rocks in the triangular field. And one was shot, and one was wounded, and one was killed, and they had to leave him there. Now, on his body was a Bible that talked about where he was from and who his father was. His father had given him the Bible. A Confederate soldier, a Georgian, picked it up, didn't realize it was inscribed, but when he got to Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, recognized the note and realized he could get it home, and he left it in the care of somebody in Chambersburg to send it home to New York. And indeed, that particular Bible made it back to his father. And uh, one of my New York friends actually found Isaac Nichols and their grave at their family's plot. So things aren't going well for the Union, but all of a sudden they get reinforcements. Here comes the 4th Maine coming up from the valley. Here comes the 99th Pennsylvania. When the many men move, a couple of cannons are able to shoot up the valley at the Confederates, and it's going to be especially costly for the Southerners in what we call the slaughter pen, the valley of death. We have a lot of unhappy names, of course, uh, on a battlefield. 
And people have been obsessed with this particular part of Devil's Den since before the Civil War, where people would go around and they would hear tales of snakes and raccoons and, and, and Indians and everything like that. So John Batchel, from Gettysburg's first historian, actually went out and painted uh, a, a sort of a watercolor showing this area. By the way, this is where the road goes through Devil's Den now. Some of you might recognize the rock ledge um, of Devil's Den. You can see the little round top in the background. Alfred Waugh later, the famous sketch artist, sketched the scene very similar to this one as well, trying to show people what had happened where, okay? This is a public hungry for imagery and understanding. Um, not far off from where Batchelder made that particular artwork, here you have the slaughter pen itself. Here is a picture taken by Alexander Gardner four days after the fighting raged here. And if you really look, you can see some of the human carnage. If you look around enough, you can see six soldiers here. Now remember, four wounded for every soldier killed, so imagine 16 wounded writhing around there as well. And imagine Union soldiers who have probably already been removed from this area that would have been this, and it would have looked indeed like a slaughter pen. And in the slaughter pen, right off to your left here, um, I'm sorry, uh, this is actually a blow up I wanted to show you. You see this rock in here? Um, you're gonna have somebody posing on that rock a little bit later and you can unfortunately get um, a view of some of the dead uh, entwined among the rocks here. I'm not showing this stuff to sensationalize this and I'll tell you why, or I'll show you that in a moment, I think. Because here's another one like this. Here are two dead Confederate soldiers um, that are you know, on the sort of the bank uh, in what we call the pond. You can see it right here, little round tops back there. And the fourth main monument, some of you might know, is right over there. The big rocks of Devil's Den are off to the left of the camera here. Um, many of you have been down to this location. Um, you can still see that rock. There's been a lot of erosion here, but you can still sort of see um, the general area where these guys were laying. Now, if I go back a little bit here, you can see, sorry, getting ahead of myself. You can see that there's one soldier lying against the rock here. Later, the photographer went on top of this rock and took a photo of just that body. And sorry, this one's going to be a little more disturbing because it shows somebody, you know, somebody who had charged into battle full of life just four days earlier. And now he is a completely unrecognizable being, right? Uh, this is, of course, what happens to all of us. You usually just don't get to see it um, lying out bleaching in the sun like this. Um, he is almost certainly a Georgian or a, an, uh, or an Alabamian. How do I know that? Because we know just where this is. I just showed you this rock, and this is the work of William A. Frazzanito. When you take a historic photo and you find out when and where it was taken, suddenly that photo is no longer simply a piece of fine art that can illustrate a magazine or a book. Now it is a primary resource that we can learn from, okay? We can learn that if this guy died right here, he has to be a member of the 44th or 48th Alabama or the second Georgia. They're the only units that could have possibly charged through there as well as we know. We also have burial records on who was who died here and who, who was mortally wounded and later died in a hospital or something. Well, let me tell you, this guy was not mortally wounded, okay? He was shot in a temple, okay? And you can see, sorry, his brain matter sort of losing out into a little puddle next to him sticking in the grass, okay? This guy died there, okay? Because he died there, we can start to uh, eliminate a lot of possibilities. I've got to narrow down to 30 or so people, okay? Maybe that's the best we can do for him. This is why we study the only 104 photos of the dead we have on all Civil War battlefields, about 41 of which were taken at Gettysburg, okay? This is a rare resource. In fact, I'll probably show you 10% of all the known photos of dead in the Civil War in this show right here. Um, now, not far away too is another guy uh, that, you know, photo simply captured all over now. This is also in the slaughter pen. You can see he's laying there uh, in a place that was filled with water. When it rains, this still fills with water. And you can see these rocks on the bottom. You can see this angle of rock. And this thing next to him even, it, you know, you can't really see it in this, but trust me, it's there. These places do not change, especially when there are rocks there. Okay, so um, maybe this is the best we can do for these people. He's in the same boat, probably a member of the 48th Alabama um, or the 2nd Georgia. So all that took place up off to the right. And as the Confederates started to charge through here, they're gonna take severe artillery fire from some guns up the valley. Um, a section of guns, that's two cannons under the command of a guy named Smith, James E. Smith. 
And as Smith is firing up the valley, um, some Union reinforcements arrive from New York and New Jersey. They're gonna march in front of the guns. The guns are no longer sweeping this valley here. By the way, while they're sweeping the valley, here come the Confederates starting to attack the side of Little Round Top. See, the fights are connected. There's not, oh, that happened at Devil's Den, and that happened at the Wheat Field, and that happened at the Little Round Top. These fights connected, and they flowed together. So those guns are fighting, and people uh, firing at people trying to attack in two different locations. In any case, when the guns sort of went silent, the Confederates, Benning's Georgia, same guy after whom Fort Benning in Georgia is named, um, are going to crash through this area. And this was photographed just perfectly right from this spot um, in, on July 6, 1863. Um, and you can not only see it the way it is, I mean, look at these three rocks right here that are simply right next to the road. Okay, they kept them there. And now because of some really good programs that make it really easy, my heritage and other things in Photoshop, you can colorize things really easily and get a view of what this might have looked like. It's not all that different from what it looks like today. And I think, again, that's my job, at least working at the American Battlefield Trust. My goal is to try to get you to get a little glimpse of the past you haven't gotten before. Drag the past forward so you say, now I get it. Now I understand, of course. And that'll make you get more interested in American history and tell other people about it. So uh, another view just from that same valley, right on top of the largest rock called the Table Rock. I'll talk about that, of course, as well, because it's one of the most famous boulders in Gettysburg. You can also see four months after the battle, soldiers posing as dead, and you can tell. People don't die that way. You've seen the photos of how they look. They go, ah, it's like in the movie Airplane, assume crashed positions. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what we have going on here. By the way, these same guys are in five different pictures posing as dead on different rocks. And yet somehow I still have to convince some people, even though it's clearly winter and it's a summer battle, even though these same guys are on different rocks, no, I think it's real. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So the fight sort of transforms. As the fight for Devil's Den is slowing down, the fight for Little Round Top is picking up. Why? Little Round Top was farther away from the Confederate line. It's that simple. And they had a lot of terrain to go over. They had to climb Big Round Top before they were going to uh, get there. So of course you know Little Round Top. It's a famous place. I hope you're getting in your kicks now because Devil's Den closes on Monday for five or six months. And Little Round Top closes in, I don't know, three weeks, six weeks, we don't know exactly, for maybe a year and a half. So if you get a chance, uh, if, if, if you're able and if you want to, go down there. So you can see beautiful scenes like this. Here is a Matthew Brady photo, beautiful photo, taken in mid-July 1863. This is the rock on which General Warren now stands to this day. The only rock on the whole battlefield are specifically prohibited from going up on, and therefore, the one that everybody wants to see. <laughs> everybody. And what does the park do? Although they considered, the War Department considered digging a moat around it to prevent access, because actually there's been damage to the monument over the years. What do they do? They put up a little sign with dark lettering that nobody can read. And then it says, visitors prohibited on this rock. And then as a battlefield guide, we are supposed to tell people, get off that rock. So it's pretty interesting. So, I'm sorry. So of course, you know the attack and defense of Little Round Top. It's one of the more famous things that happens at Gettysburg. You're going to have four regiments of Union soldiers uh, from uh, Michigan and New York and Pennsylvania and Maine. They're gonna arrive five minutes before the Southerners attack. The Southerners, weary after their long march, they've marched more than 20 miles to get there and they're attacking on the second hottest day of the entire summer over by far the most difficult terrain Gettysburg has to offer. Many of them without any water. I mean, I can't even give this talk without water. And I didn't stay up all night and march 20 miles to get here. Right? In fact, they're even paying my mileage, so check that out. I feel like they decided to unlike an Alabama. Okay. And they are going to make this attack. Now, the jo there's also Georgians, Texans, and Arkansans who had to march eight miles and are still carrying 50 pounds of stuff each. Some of them stacked some of their stuff before they went into battle, others didn't. Okay, I mean, I'd be reluctant leaving my, you know, knapsack behind, you know, when, who knows what I'm gonna be charging 10 feet or, or 50 miles before I get back to it. So you want a lot of stuff with you later, like your winter coat, carry that thing with you all year. Okay, just keep that stuff in mind. There's gonna be a tremendous fight there as the Georgians, Texans and Arkansans first, uh, mainly Texans on the lower slopes of Big Round Top, um, and then Alabamians coming off the upper slope. They attack the Union position. You know what happens. It goes back and forth like a great wave until a third of the men from Texas and Alabama are down. A third of the men from Maine, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and New York are down. Uh, both sides are using the ammunition from their dead and wounded comrades. And of course, the Alabamians, right on the end of the line, are forming for one final charge. 
And although it'd be tempting to say it didn't happen this way, it actually did. The main men put bayonets on the end of their guns because they couldn't shoot anymore, and they charged down into the weary Alabama. Of course, who had? Stayed up all night and did everything I just went through. And uh, they finally had enough. And uh, you know, hundreds of them were captured. Uh, I think a lot of them were happy, from what I've read, to happy to be captured, because you're not thinking about rotting away in a northern prison in New York or Chicago. You're thinking, and we're all this way. I need to rest right now. We're all like this. When you're tired, hungry, thirsty, or have to use the bathroom, you're thinking about food, water, and sleep, and a bathroom. Okay? I probably messed one of you up in the audience, by the way, by saying <laughs> it's okay. Just slip out the bath if you have to. You can. Um, so after the attack and defense of Little Round Top, you're going to have, of course, intense fighting going on on Culp's Hill. And this happens decidedly afterward. One of the few attacks uh, that happens at night uh, in the Civil War. I'd say rather few attacks like that. And of course, it was supposed to take place at the same time. Easy for you to say when, you know, your lines are six miles apart. That's one of the big disadvantages that General Lee had. Meade took up a compact interior line where he could shift troops back and forth with more troops on the high ground, on the defensive, on the home turf. So the Union had huge advantages going for them, and it's no surprise that wherever the Confederates achieve some gain, the Union shows up with overwhelming force to repulse them. And that's exactly the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. So the Confederates are going to go ahead and attack East Cemetery Hill. You can see a little bit of that going on over here. And then Culp's Hill. And I'll show you some pictures of that. Culp's Hill consists of two hills, Upper Culp's Hill over there, and Lower Culp's Hill right here with a little saddle in between. Okay, and we're gonna talk about that, but before we do, note that the Confederates are looking pretty good on numbers here. Why? Because the fighting on the south end of the battlefield resulted in not only all the reserves going to the Union left, but five of the six brigades that had been on Culp's Hill um, actually moved away. So there was one real brigade left facing the Confederate attack. This is, you know, famously, George Sears Green's New Yorkers. Green was an old engineer, born 1801, died 1899, didn't want any part of any other century. Um, <laughs> sorry, stole that, stole that joke from Tim. <laughs> we steal from each other. Um, and, uh, you know, Green had his men build breastworks over here. Um, and when all these other uh, troops left and they couldn't occupy both hills, they had them sort of dig a little, now famous little piece of earthwork called a traverse that allowed them to face the Confederates when they, you know, wrapped around the Union line. How can this happen? Well, during the Battle of Culp's Hill, Upper Culp's Hill was strong. There was all sorts of, uh, you know, entrenchments, breastworks, and, and log, and, and rock, and everything, and the Confederates are pushing against it with no success. But this hill was unoccupied. These are the brigades that left, and the Confederates come in and see empty trenches, and they occupy them, okay? And if it wasn't dark, they would have known that they were only 160 yards from the Baltimore Pike, the lifeline of the Union Army. The best thing the Confederates have going for them with their long, extra long line is the fact that they controlled eight of the 10 roads leading into Gettysburg. The Union needed a good road, they only had one really good road, and it was this Baltimore Pike you see right here. And the Confederates got pretty close to it. Had they been able to capture and control that road, the Union would have had to fight to get it back or leave, okay? It was that serious. You need a road to get your ammunition up, to get your wounded away, and things like that. So the Confederates occupied Lower Culp's Hill, and then uh, they are still gonna try to attack Upper Culp's Hill, and eventually pitch blackness um, and mutual consent brings an end to the fighting day. And I'll pick this up in a second, because we do have some photos right after the battle and then several months after the battle that show these earthworks here. You can see here uh, earthworks that were made of earth and stone and log. Okay, you can see how this could turn one soldier into 10 by being almost completely hidden. They can load their guns in complete security. They can fire down the hill at the Confederates coming back up. Many of you know about this, and you can see the earth is still, um, you know, the earthworks are still visible. They have been redone in the 1890s and the 1930s, and you may have been able to see soldiers sitting on that very rock uh, right here. I'm sorry, not soldiers, photographic assistants is what I meant to say. Uh, the Park Service has done a great job recently clearing some of this land. It's beautiful. We can finally see what the soldiers saw, uh, and, and that's been a great job by the park and the Gettysburg Foundation down there. Matthew Brady took four photos around there with his crew, and I showed you one just there. Here's another one. You can really hard to, it's hard to see the shape of this boulder, which for years was called the Confederate Sharpshooter's Boulder because they got behind it and sharp shot from it. Um, it was sharpshooted. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, 
but now it seems to be called the Forbes Boulder. I'll show you why in a second. You can see the piece on top right there. You can see the distinct overhang uh, right over there. So, and now you can access it by a trail. So it used to be very precipitous. Now it's much easier. Um, so that night was a rough night, but the Confederates made some gains. Remember, they captured Lower Culp's Hill. Uh, Robert E. Lee says, ooh, here's some advantage here. I'm going to send three new brigades over to that part of the hill, okay? Sounds pretty good, right? Except that the Union gets their five brigades that had left back, and General Meade sends four more for fun. So the Confederates get three fresh brigades. The Union has nine, okay? That's the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. That doesn't stop the Confederates from fighting fiercely and ferociously uh, to get this thing back. And for seven hours on the morning of July 3rd, the Union attacks first, Confederates counterattack, and this goes back and forth like its own great wave. You literally have Southerners facing this way, turning around and charging Union soldiers off in that direction. It's a chaotic fight. Um, there's some famous scenes in here that I think a lot of you know about. There's friendly fire, which isn't so friendly. You've got some fraternization going on at Spangler Spring, or so the myth says, and back and forth it goes. But really, that fighting peters out, and the Union recaptures Lower Culp's Hill, and they are in possession of the ground that they want to be in possession of, okay? And that's sort of a summary, almost as quickly as I can do it, of the attack and defense of the Rocky Bulwarks at Gettysburg, at least if I limit those to Devil's Den, Little Round Top, and Culp's Hill. There are other rocky spots I'll talk about as well. Now, on Culp's Hill, uh, Edwin Forbes came here right after the battle. Supposedly he's here on July 4th. So right after the battle is over, I don't know how this <coughs> sort of northern-based sketch artist is behind Confederate lines. It's because they're already gone. And he kind of gets up in the air and shows the Confederate sharpshooter's boulder. You see him hiding behind it, now called the Forbes Rock. You can see the Union breastworks boulder up on top. You see a line of Union soldiers. And when the park finally cleared the trees there recently, I went out there and took photos, and I realized that Forbes wasn't at ground level. So I got, no joke, a 13-foot selfie stick, got it up <laughs> as high as I could, and took my photo. So, but you still see, in this photo, the two, the Union boulder and the Confederate boulder aren't enough apart. In other words, I need a 50-foot selfie stick, which I don't even know if they make that. <laughs> so, so, but you can see the curve of the hill, you can imagine it, and I found where Edward Forbes apparently stood when he sketched this thing. So more, more than we can do when we work in concert with a park to steward the uh, place to make it look the way it did at the time of the battle. Now, as for the most photographed place that includes the human carnage, I'll only show one um, at Gettysburg. That is, of course, the Rose Farm which you are allowed to access now via a cattle guard, uh, I'm sorry, a cattle fence that you can walk by. Ask a friend if you don't know how to get there. There's probably 50 people in this room, if there are 50, um, who <laughs> actually know how to get out there. If you haven't been, read the work of William Frazzanito, and you'll learn all about this split rock right here. I'll ask you for the modern, I'm gonna show you to look at that rock, and then not only this rock, but a very distinctive crack right there. Um, that I mean, just leaves no doubt that this is exactly where it is. Uh, the wood line is in a pretty similar spot, and I'll just say that you know these guys are photographed in several different photos. This guy with the bent knee, which was the key to linking all these together, um, shows up in several photos as well. So I mean, there's a lot of battlefield to explore when you use the rocks. Um, not far from there, I, I lied, there is a second one. Uh, there's a second line of bodies, and this is especially sad. If you zoom in on this one, you can see the soldier closest to the camera. In dragging into that position, they often use the belt to move somebody, and his pants come down. And here he is, face down to the earth, far from home, with his buttocks exposed, in complete opposition of everything that 19th century America called a good death. Okay, I mean, imagine if this, this is somebody's son, someone's brother, maybe somebody's dad. And here it is, the death far from home, you know, captured on film. So a very unhappy scene, not to mention that for the soldiers you can see, they're disfigured as putrefaction um, and degradation of, of the body sort of sets in there. Now at the end of these, of, of this row of bodies, you can see a rock that William Presley, you know, if you don't know him, he's the author, uh, that, that, that is the Dean of Civil War Photographic Study. And he said in 1974, when his book, his first book came out, that that rock, heavier than it looks, is currently embedded upside down in the ground. Um, and somebody read that, and they took it, okay? And then they sent him a note and said, ha ha, the rock now sits next to my fireplace. And there it was for about uh, 14 years, it was gone. And then one day, it returned in about 2002 or 2003. And it wasn't in the right spot, so I moved it right back to where it was. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I said I love rocks. 
So I lined it up and said, yep, that's the rock. I see the decision cracks. And then, of course, you pose with the rock. <laughs> um, so then it was back. And then it made some news, and what happens? It disappeared another year later. And let me tell you, you can see that's not a small rock, okay? It is heavier than it looks. Somebody took some real effort. I still suspect to this day that somebody might have just rolled it somewhere else. And because getting it through or over that fence couldn't have been easy. It may have never left, okay? So um, the mystery goes on, and I'm going to talk about more photo mysteries um, and other mysteries later. Guys, this thing, I am dated. Look at that rock. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> that's not home tree. I don't know what it is. Okay. So I'm obsessed with rocks. So when I meet William Frazzanito, I often meet him at Devil's Den and we'll pose next to some sort of a boulder. Cause you know, I wouldn't even live here. I wouldn't even have ever met my wife if it wasn't for this guy. And he did ask me to name my firstborn after him and I said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> William Frazzanito Edelman. <laughs> it wasn't gonna work. Um, and when I did first come here in 1988, this is my first trip. Some of you will laugh at me that I didn't come here until 88, but 125th anniversary is that very week. And you know, this is when they, you couldn't even access, there were still cows in the Valley of Death, and there were cattle all over the little round top, and you, to get to certain parts of Devil's Den, you had to actually climb a fence if you were even allowed to. Um, Devil's Den was completely covered by wood at the time. I mean, you could basically walk up to the rocks and see, De see little round top, and that was it, okay? So you kind of got lost in Devil's Den. One time, and my first trip there, I was very familiar with Frazzanito's work. And I kind of knew the photos that were taken there. And I knew which one I wanted to find, the dead sharpshooter, the home of the rebel sharpshooter. And I'm walking around this part of Devil's Den, and I glanced up. And I kind of knew I was close, but I was in the woods, so I didn't know. And I saw it. And I was writing in my journal at the time. And I actually scribbled down you know, what I was feeling at the time. That moment would lead to Tim and I actually writing our first book together, and that was the Devil's Den book. I would later go on to write more about Little Round Top um, as well. And Tim and I might come back and combine these books and actually do a, a, a new book because we've got a lot of info. But this is what I wrote. Somewhere in Devil's Den, this is July 18, 1988. I almost said 1888. Whoa, I just saw the dead sharpshooter position. I'm trembling, I can't breathe right. My heart is pounding quickly and my mouth is dry. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that's about as neat as I write. <laughs> um, and, and I still, even reading it now, I still get worked up about it. So for those of you in this room, taking time out on a beautiful day, I already know what you mean. <laughs> I, I mean, you know what I mean by saying this. It, it, it changed my life forever. Um, this moment and the other experiences I had on the battlefield, and I know I don't have to convince y'all to uh, go out to the battlefield and use them. Of course, when I lined up the photo then, I already knew what it looked like. Here's a colorized version. Colorized version. Before colorization was easy, he actually had to paint this thing. Mark Maritato, um, an artist who's made a lot of good prints. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but I knew what I wanted to do, um, and that was to go to that spot. Even though I knew the soldier was moved, it was a historic spot, and I was going to lay down. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Now, some people might consider this anything from disrespectful to uncool to um, morbid to a lot of other things, okay? But for me, it was just never in doubt that I was going to. I think it's important to add that I have seen every range of emotions on battlefields. I've seen people happy, sad. I've seen them lash out, pass out, uh, be satisfied, be the reverse. And I think it's important to know that you should interact with any legal way that you'd like with your battlefield. Um, not everybody goes at it the same way. I just wanted to add that. Do this on my first trip and on my second trip. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to see me aging in this <laughs> started giving tours. And she'd be like, lay down in the spot, Gary. So, I mean, I still, to this day, I do it several times every year. I don't mind doing it. You know, in the end, too, this isn't where he died. Oh my God, I'm actually getting a question during the talk. I mean, inevitably, it will happen. So have you arranged for a dead Gary Idol in the period of the dead? <laughs> so, so that's pretty messed up. <laughs> it was, when I'm dead, will, will my corpse be dragged there? Very interesting idea. Um, I will say this, although it is not allowed by the Park Service unless you get permission, uh, the, my letter has been written for 20 years already. And my wife or my survivors know exactly where to put my ashes. And maybe it's right at Devil's Den. Okay. Um, Follow up, Gary. What's that? Will you live stream it? <laughs> <laughs> She's joking. What's that? 
Yeah. <laughs> Gary dead at Dell's dead. Okay. So, <laughs> what she's talking about is this thing now where anything you talk about, is it going to be live stream? Are you going to video it? I mean, funerals, like everything. People want it live streamed. It's really crazy. Like things people pay hundreds of dollars to come to. Hey, where's the live stream? <laughs> you know, so I find that funny. That is really messed up. I'm gonna say that. <laughs> and I'm considering. <laughs> so, so, by the way, I'm showing you like 140th of the pictures that I have here. And you can see sometimes I'm in my guy's uniform. Oh, with my terrible, my very brief 90s facial hair you got. Right <laughs> and then when my kid was born, I brought him there. <laughs> By the way, there's a few people out there in the audience now who ate smiling. So, I <laughs> can't help it, and it still goes on. You know? Now, lucky for me, I'm obsessed with not only dead people, but also here's Alfred Wad, the famous sketch artist. I call him Wad because I met his great grandnephew, and he said his grandparents always pronounced it Wad. That's close enough for me. Okay, but I like the way Wad sounds better. Either way, you see the distinctive crack behind his head, even the little thing where his boot is. I mean, you can see all those things today. And you know, and from my first trip in the same clothes, I went there and posed there. I'm a little <laughs> sad, my head doesn't hit the crack of the rock, and you get the idea. So I'll just cruise through some of these. <laughs> 80s sweat going on there. Like, you know, stuff straight out. I, now I do them in 3D as well. Um, and then back in the day, I would actually Photoshop myself into because I was Photoshop. So I had a dark room, and do you know how much? This cost like nine bucks back then to do. Like I needed several different pieces of paper. I'd burn and dodge it in and everything like that. And of course then, that meant that I had to burn myself in with the dead shark. <laughs> that wasn't enough. I wanted me and slightly older me next to the dead shark. <laughs> Sorry, I had a lot of time on my hands back then. And then I wanted to sit without the dog. And the most recent version, I swear I'm done now, is now that you have all this TikTok and, and, and Snapchat going on, people then put my head on Alfred's head <laughs> while I'm talking, and his mouth goes like this. So it's a wonderful world. <laughs> now, I'm going to talk more about Devil's Den because it has the most stories associated with it. But let me be clear. After the Battle of Gettysburg, Culp's Hill was the rocky bulwark everyone cared about. Okay, it was right next to town. It had the uh, bullet scarred trees up there. It had the earthworks up there. Devil's Den didn't have any of that. Little Round Top had the stone walls and all, but it was miles away from town. Everybody walked out for the first few years and they saw Culp's Hill. Culp's Hill was the place, okay? And, and photographers covered it only intermittently, but as time went on, people told more stories about Devil's Den, Little Round Top, with its sweeping views. Culp's Hill, you can't see anything once you're up there after the trees started growing up. But this guy, Emmanuel Bushman, told story after story, and some of the best stories we tell about Devil's Den, namely about the 30-foot snake that inhabited the area that would eat little kids for breakfast every day. Ha, 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 ha. And they could never kill or capture him, and he died in his lair, and that's why they call it Devil's Den. He told all sorts of other good stories. He talks about how the devil's bath was knocked off by a bolt of lightning, how it used to be called Raccoon Den, and a man named DeGroff uh, went in there, and the raccoons charged on him for trespassing, and he was almost killed. And the best story of all about that, that snake was apparently turning gray with age. This particular snake he was talking about was only 20 feet long, but it had a capacious mouth that could swallow a whole dog. And they said that his father saw it, and his great-grandfather had seen it, and his great-grandfather heard from the Native Americans who used to call it Heap Big Snake. <laughs> we just we have great stuff coming from him. And this helped to, to get us a lot more information and photography about that. One of the first things that happened is the first historian at Gettysburg, John Batchelder, came and he said, no, no, those big rocks aren't Devil's Den. Devil's Den is the cave where the spring comes out of and where Lore says the snake used to live. And it's this particular thing. So that's the actual Devil's Den or the original Devil's Den. John Batchelder said people go and they see the rocks up there, but they haven't been within 20 steps of Devil's Den. This is the actual Devil's Den. So that's a rocky sort of thing I had to talk about. You know, and while Devil's Den and Little Round Top became popular, it became even more so while amusement parks started springing up around the battlefield. You could go to Weibel Woods in Rosewoods, the bloodiest woods of the entire Civil War, where 9,000 soldiers were killed and wounded and captured. Um, and you could go and dance and listen to music. Or you could stop at Tipton Park opposite Devil's Den, and you could drink, you could eat, and you could dance there as well. Or you could go to Round Top Park, which would eventually sport a roller rink, a casino, a brothel, two restaurants, 
a, a museum, the museum that would eventually become the National Park Services Museum. So you got lots going on there. And here's a photographic studio at Devil's Den with a guy named Jacob Muffer uh, sitting right there. You can see the photos he's trying to set. Um, you could see that they needed fresh water, so they're pumping fresh water into a trough there. We call this the trough rock, and this is me getting into named boulders on the battlefield. You can still go and see the trough today. I took this photo all of yesterday because Devil's Den's about to close. I'll probably stop there again on the way back to shoot some videos. Um, so that is the trough rock. Um, and as these commercial ventures went on, some of which I already mentioned, you know, uh, Tipton Park over here, uh, Wyville Woods is right way up there. They're getting to these places via an electric trolley that would go around Devil's Den and cross the face of Little Round Top and then back behind Little Round Top. Um, and it was a big, uh, you know, sort of amusement park in the 1890s at Gettysburg. Here's the trolley going right through Devil's Den. Here's the rocks by the road that I showed you earlier. And you can see a little bit of the buildings of Tipton Park there in the background with the little round top looming over them. Now, this rock is the rock I promised to mention anyway. This is the table rock. Uh, the, supposedly that up there weighs 200 tons and it's gonna fall. Engineers know it's gonna fall. They mark hash marks on it in the 1970s and it hasn't moved since the 1970s, so that's good. You can stand under it. Um, so the Table Rock became famous for a number of reasons, uh, namely because it's the first thing you see when you drive in there. And pieces are always falling out. And here's a text I have with Tim Smith last year. Yes, this is actually what we text about. Wow, look, a piece of the Table Rock fell out. No way, whoa! You always said it yourself. Every once in a while, a piece of Devil's Dead just falls off. It's true. The battlefield is always changing, whether it be trees, rocks, structures, or otherwise, or even erosion. Um, it's always changing. Uh, just last summer, the famous Sphinx came down. Now, most people, it's famous to like 12 nerds, you know, these people over here. Um, you know, and these, uh, the Sphinx was, it, it resembled the Sphinx of Egypt, and then it just a tree fell out last summer, and there it falls. So a few of us mourned it. A lot of people watched the video, and then we moved on with our lives since then. I want you to know that. Um, in the meantime, people would gather at Devil's Den, and you didn't bring a camera with you back, with you back then. You went to the camera. Where was the camera? Set up right at the table rock of Devil's Den. Sign there, there's a ladder. If somebody wants to climb up onto the rocks or something, they're going to start to take group portraits. And we estimate more than 30,000 group portraits were taken at the Table Rock between um, 1888 and 1910. Okay, and we know this because of negative numbers and whatnot. And I've got a small collection of these that I collect. Now, what local people quickly realized was oh, okay, lots of photos being taken here. If I carve my name or my initials in the rock, tens of thousands of people will see my name. I'll be famous. Check it out. So local people came out. These aren't soldiers, okay? This is Maurice Spock, and that is C.M. Young, who's a famous artist who still has work, works of art in the Louvre and in a museum in Bolivia. And I forget his name, the C.H., the R.C. And you can look around, you can identify a lot of them. And by the way, I still feel that these streaks running down the boulders are the remnant of lead from the battle that have washed down the boulders over the years, but I can't prove that. And some people have said, no, I need like a metallurgist if there's anybody in the room. In any case, you know, this graffiti got way out of hand. It was all over Devil's Den. By the way, this is Maurice Fox, a lifelong paraplegic. There's no way he made his own rock carving. So he could be said to somebody, could you go up there and carve my name so my name will appear? He was a successful businessman in town, which is kind of cool. So in 1894, when the government started coming in and taking over uh, the park at Gettysburg, they started what was called carefully removing them. Okay, which meant taking a massive chisel and a hammer and pounding into the rock and scraping the rock, the government chisels, you could say. Uh, you know, just absolutely scrape down the rocks at Devil's Den. And walking around Devil's Den, you could still see these scrape marks in 200 locations around the den, but especially on this rock, because the whole rock is basically covered with chisel marks. And therefore, when people posed that after 1894 in this area, you would just see these massive patches where the most deep chiseling was done by the government chisel. Um, but we also have things that aren't actually rock carvings. We have rock paintings, okay? Here's one to John Wheeler. See, soldiers came and they erected monuments to their units and to the people who died there. And often the first monuments on the battlefield, in fact, the first ones, were all to people who had fallen there. You put a marker and say, this is where Jed Chapman or uh, Strong Vincent or Fred Taylor actually died. Okay? Um, and in some cases, before those monuments were put up, they simply painted it there or put a little sign. This one is to John Wheeler, the highest ranking soldier from the state of Indiana killed in the Battle of Gettysburg. The painting's long gone, but because we have the photo, we know where the rock is, and it's right across from the monuments of the 20th Indiana in Rose Woods. Um, many of you are familiar with the monuments of the 5th New Hampshire, made itself of boulders, five of them, because it's the 5th New Hampshire. 
um, uh, you know, right at the intersection of, uh, of some avenues that we feel in the distance, Devil's Bend's off to the left. And supposedly their colonel, Colonel, colonel Edward Cross, who had a premonition of death that day, of course, he apparently had a premonition of death at every battle. Oh, this is my last battle. Put on a black bandana. Oh, this is my last battle. Well, this time he told General Hancock, too late, General, this is my last battle. And, 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 you know, and he, I won't be getting my star. And he was shot in the afternoon, and that would be his last battle. And he was supposed to be shot by a Confederate behind that rock named the Cleft Rock. We have names for these boulders um, if you care to follow them. Now, not far from here, if you sort of backed up, there was an old photo, I don't have it with me, that showed veterans gathered around a small, much smaller rock right behind there that we think was their sort of advanced monument placement there. And, uh, and uh, you know, so Tim and I often go out there and we point it out, and I had grabbed this on a screen grab here. And, you know, I probably could have gotten a better face for Tim. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, this, but this dude goes to the Farnsworth house every Sunday, and there's addressing Gettysburg there, and Tim just destroys me somehow. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and not work on the screen grab, and I'm going to get that one. And I point to the original 5th New Hampshire marker that I think is there, uh, standing right there. In fact, let's get a better look at it. <laughs> I hope this goes on YouTube. <laughs> Dave is nodding his head there. You know, so, so that's one of our things. Now, another famous rock in Gettysburg is, of course, the elephant rock. When you look at it from here, you can pretty clearly see that's the elephant's head. You see its body over there. And on top of that, there's a famous rock carving uh, to a guy named, I say famous, I'm sorry, it's to us. Uh, 1849, it's the oldest known rock carving on the Gettysburg battlefield, at least that, that is dated. And if you get on top, and my days, I haven't been up there in about seven years again, and at some point I won't be able to get up there anymore. It's not an easy climb there. Um, but it says B40, 1849. I wish I had a, an embarrassing picture of Tim sort of standing here, because now I'm used to nailing him. Oh, wait, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so here he is. I, I, I'm not sure if he actually regrets the sort of jorts position with the dark socks, but I thought I'd put it up there as a little bit of revenge there. But he's pointing to the elephant rock, which you see in the distance there. And to orient you, he's on the road through Devil's Den, and the biggest rocks are right behind the camera over there. So uh, again, when I had a lot of time on my hands in the summer of 1994, I stood on every rock inside the road at Devil's Den, and I drew it from above. See, for those of you using Google Earth now, and I know there's some young people in the room who are probably better than us at Google Earth already, uh, we didn't have access to satellite imagery. So I stood on every rock and I got the approximate shape and I made this map and it took me a long time. And then because that wasn't nerdy enough, I then marked on it which rock has scratch outs on it with three hashes and which one still has a carving on it with a C. So, so, so the work can actually continue because we keep finding new carvings and I need to update the map if we ever do another book like this. One such carving you can still see is the J. Tipton, right on top of the largest boulders at Devil's End. It looks like they tried to scratch it out, but it was too deep. And another one that we didn't find when the book had come out that actually says John Houck, and a specific date, May 18, 1867. If you ever heard of, never heard of John Houck, that's okay. You may have heard of Houck's Ridge. That's the ridge that goes off from Devil's End. He owned it. He's the guy quarrying rock south of town there, and he owned Devil's Den during the battle, and he put his name right on a rock. Pretty cool. We love rock carvings. Those are the first monuments on the battlefield, specifically the ones to Strong Vincent and Charles Hazlitt that are on Little Round Top. We know those were there by 1864 or 65 at the latest. Another carving that I haven't come up with publicly because I didn't make the discovery, a woman said her 20-year-old son actually located this rock carving. It says H. Morse, and we later had it says 12th Massachusetts. Of course, the 12th Massachusetts didn't fight anywhere near where this carving was, is found, and that's at the Devil's Kitchen uh, between Big Round Top and Devil's Den. And let me tell you, it's not just sitting on the rock. If you go down a pathway, and then you go a little further, and then you're extra thin, you can go down, and then you can bend down, it's right there. It makes no sense why it would be there. The guy had no hope of anyone ever seeing it, and only last year, or two years ago, did somebody bring it to our attention. And Henry Morse lived until like 1913, um, which is really cool. So we're still finding new rock carvings. This is something you can do as well. And one of the mystery rock carvings, and I'll talk about mysteries um, near the end, but one of the mystery rock carvings is actually this one. There's a guy in the 4th Alabama. He attacked Little Round Top. Um, and he wrote to Confederate veterans, and he had been corresponding with a commissioner, the one Confederate commissioner at the Gettysburg National Military Park, a guy named Robbins, who happened to be in the same regiment as him. And he said, you remember that rock I, I fought behind and then retired behind and had an overhang that was four feet high? He's like, yeah. And the commissioner apparently wrote to him and said, 
I chiseled your name with a simple letter WAIB. This guy who's writing this is named WC Warren. And since people have known about this, myself included, for more than 30 years I've been looking for this rock card. That doesn't stop somebody from finding like a line on a rock and saying, it's part of the W, I found it, let's call Gettysburg Magazine. Um, which, by the way, drives me crazy because they're usually nowhere near where the fourth Alabama fought. It's a pretty interesting mystery because we know that he corresponded in 1898 with this commissioner. By then, the Park Service had already chiseled all the things off of the table rock. On that table rock, before they, when they chiseled it, was one made war. But, you know, this was three years too early, so it wouldn't have worked that way. Would this commissioner really have gone onto battlefield land and carved somebody's initials when they just got rid of all the carvings? We don't know, okay? But it's a really cool mystery and one that anybody in this room could solve. Uh, pretty cool. And, uh, and there's some stuff on the internet about it if you want to read more. Here's a rock we call the movable rock. Probably not the best name, but if somebody that's, you know, not super light leans on this upper rock there, which probably weighs a ton or more, it actually rocks. And apparently it used to sway and rock when the wind blew. This is, in other words, if you stand on that rock and look straight ahead, you're about 10 steps from General Warren on Little Round Top. So this rock used to sway when the wind blew. Now I have to like get on top of it and jump a little bit, but it'll like rock back and forth. It's kind of cool as a, as a human to be able to move a one, or one ton or more rock. Kind of cool stuff. Um, this is not a rock, but I guess it's made of rocks. This is the McAllister's Mill, and the reason I bring this up is because I think many of you know Gettysburg is a big stop on the Underground Railroad, and uh, since the stop on the Underground Railroad, you know, they wouldn't have a stop in the mill. They're going to have a series of places, and apparently they would have, uh, you know, sort of runaway slaves hide out on, under what is now called the Slave Rock on the north side of Colts Hill, okay? I'm not, I, didn't, I don't have an exact picture of it, but it's a jumble of rocks just north of the Culp's Hill Tower, kind of down from there. And if you go down from there, you'll be able to find them. There's only so many places where you can actually hide a family under pretty cool stuff. Um, and then there's this one that I've talked about a lot, okay? This is an extreme detail, actually, of an Alexander Gardner view. And you can actually see a dead Confederate soldier here. By the way, that's the trough rock right there, little round top rising above. And Plum Run is right there. So in other words, you're standing on or at the, right below the table rock that Douglas said looking for a little round top. And there's that dead Confederate soldier, uh, William Fresnito pointed out, again, four wounded for every kill. And there's this rock with sort of a smirk going on right there, okay? And when I used to try to look for rocks at Devil's Den, I mean, in, in historic photos, and I would fail, there would be that rock smirking at me. So we call it the smirking rock, or the smart-ass rock, and that one actually has made it onto some maps and things like that. If you ever want to find this rock, the Plum Run Bridge is right next to it. In other words, it sort of guards the Plum Run Bridge, and you can see its distinctive smirk, it's laughing at you, okay? Um, now, there's another rock called the Brook Rock, and I'm not trying to turn this into a full inventory. This won't go on forever. But supposedly, Colonel John Rudder Brook, commanding a brigade, went in right before they charged up to the Rose Farm, basically, up a steep ridge. He gave a speech to his, to his men. He went onto a rock, and supposedly he did it. And then supposedly one of those soldiers went back later and made a cross on it, Brook's Cross, okay? And this has been identified as Brook's Cross. I don't know, it isn't about the right spot. It does sort of look like they used part of the existing craft that's right here, and then they sort of made an X on it. I'm just not fully convinced, but I didn't put it in the mystery section. The, the Brook Rock is right above the trolley line between there and the Rose Farm. Here's the Bullet Hole Rock, hardly anybody sees it because it's so overgrown. Right next to Warren Avenue, going up little round top, it looks like it was shot by a machine gun or something like that. Of course, what those are are drill holes so they could either put explosives or more likely wooden pegs in there that they could pound in them, fill them with water, the things contract and expand and they crack the rock together. But they never got to that rock. They either didn't need to do it or the rock proved too tough. And in the very last hole, there's a drill bit broken off in it. So maybe the rock won. <laughs> uh, another rock that is that we'll probably never find is supposedly during the Battle of Devil's Den, the 124th New York. You see some of the veterans here. I wish they could have told us. Supposedly they took the lifeless bodies of their colonel and their major, Ellis and Cromwell, and dragged them onto a rock. And while they were fighting, there's the lifeless bodies of their field officers behind them, and they're fighting away still. Guides claim to know which rock it is because there's one big flat rock over there, but I don't know how we know that. You know, did they really put it right behind the line where it is? So we don't know. So another semi-mystery rock, the Alice and Cromwell rock. 
Another one here, uh, this is a James Smith's battery right on top of Devil's Den. I think that's James Smith, but look, we've got New Yorkers and the first Texas and the fifth in Georgia getting together. Wow, a little bit of fraternization going on 30, 40 years after the Civil War. Supposedly above there somewhere, Henry Hunt and James Smith, the battery commander, Henry Hunt is in command of all the artillery of Gettysburg, stood up there and said, Captain, get a painter and paint upon this rock that just a few yards to the right and north of where we now stand, your leftmost gun was positioned. And he gives some other clues where I'm sure I know where this rock is. It's the highest rock at Devil's Den where you can stand naturally. And there's a piece of the top sort of, sort of uh, off of the rock. And I, I want to get like five people and flip it over one day to see if they actually painted or carved onto it or something like that. Haven't been able to yet. Here is the McAllister's Mill uh, Dam rock. You can see Tim standing out there. I mean, maybe if you find one of these, you can name them yourself. And it is so tough to get people to use the name you picked for a rock. Here's a rock that is the little round top storm damage rock. It should have been easy. Somehow it took me 18 years to locate this thing, but one day I happened upon it right there and then posed in, uh, in victory with it. I mean, that's the path out to the 20th name. It's not exactly an obscure location, but there it was. And of course, one thing you can do with rocks, even in not rocky areas, is go to the buildings they built from Gettysburg's rocks, like this. Lee's headquarters was built from rock from when they made the railroad cut right behind it. And when you look at these buildings, you can still see, like that rock there, the stones are in the exact same spot. You know, and yes, I've lined them up. <laughs> I still have some time on my hands, I guess. So you can get closer to the rocks even with the buildings. Another kind of a breastworks boulder. And as we had trouble finding this one, and there it is. Right below the 44th New York Monument, uh, although the stone walls have really de uh, degraded, I hope some of the rehabilitation of Little Round Top addresses it. And maybe my favorite extant rock on the Gettysburg Battlefield is this little thing here. You see how they had to sort of build the, the uh, platform around it? In other words, this is the Wheatfield tour stop on the Gettysburg Electric Trolley. Look, stop at the Wheatfield. Not only is the first Michigan Monument there, not only is the tree still there, but that rock is still just right there in the same spot. And yes, when I found it, found it I looked up to see if the sign had grown up way up high with the tree. <laughs> and no, it didn't, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Although some tree person, I said this in a talk, and they were like, no, 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 it wouldn't grow up anyway. It would only fold into it. So I still like the story. Uh, there's supposedly a story in a 19, no, there is, in a 1905 Gettysburg newspaper talking about two rocks. I think it's these two rocks right here. And they said, was there ever a boy in Gettysburg who wanted to be a man, or a man who had been a boy in Gettysburg who did not avail himself of jumping off of the two rocks into the beautiful waters of Rock Creek? And finally, Tim and I went out and found that. Those two rocks in an obscure location. Um, and that really sort of, you know, ends what I want to talk about the rocks we know about. I'll get into the final thing here, and that is mysteries. We have a lot of photographic and other mysteries at Gettysburg. They're all related to images or, or stories about rock art and things like that. And imagine trying to find this. I've been, many of us have been trying for more than two decades to locate this. How are we supposed to do this? Our only hope is to find that tree or this stuff or that tree in another photograph whose location we know, and then we can line it up. But you know, we haven't been able to do that. There's no rocks here. Okay, so we have no hope, little hope of ever finding out where this was taken. However, there are others that we should be able to. Look at this massive boulder. It's at least eight feet long on Willoughby's Run, and nobody's been able to find it. Even though we have, uh, you know, we have, uh, looks like I lost a picture there. Um, we have two more pictures of it as well, and we still haven't been able to locate it. So an ongoing mystery that one of y'all can solve. Here is a rock at Spangler Spring. You can't see it well in this version, but it says Richard uh, or our Houston, Baltimore, Maryland. You can see some rock areas right there. It's supposedly on a rock above Spangler Spring. We haven't been able to find that rock. Here is an Albert Waugh drawing saying, uh, Vincent's Brigade driven in uh, the Devil's Den Gettysburg. This isn't Devil's Den. There's nowhere you can stand and see rocks like this and see South Mountain and Seminary Ridge. So it has to be either Big Round Top or Little Round Top. We haven't been able to find this yet either. And, and you know what? His drawings were accurate enough where you should be able to find them. Um, here's the Palisade Rock on Wolf Hill. Wolf Hill is a tall hill next to Culp's Hill. Very little fighting over there. Very little of it is preserved by the Park Service and the American Battlefield Trust. Um, but supposedly there was this Palisade Rock. There's just no way that thing could still be standing like that. I mean, it has to have fallen over by now, but I would love to find that someday. Uh, okay, and here's that shot I showed you with the extra two shots. I mean, we have it from three different directions. You see the hillside, we should be able to find it, but, you know, Willoughby's Run changes course. All, all rivers and streams do this over time, so maybe it's buried. Maybe it got blown up to build a bridge there. 
um, but we can't find it. Here's another Alfred Waugh drawing, which I still consider a mystery, although I thought I'd give my number one contender. You can see one rock and another right there. This was drawn right after the Battle of Gettysburg. It says round top um, somewhere right there, uh, and nobody's been able to find this. I mean, it looks up the hill over here. There's a few reasons why we should be able to find it, but nobody's been able to. Uh, here again, it looks like I've duplicated that Vincent's Brigade driven in uh, thing. Um, and then I believe lastly, Here's a photo taken in July of 1865. Um, you know, and there are other photo mysteries, but I'm only going through the ones that involve rocks, okay? Some of you might see one of the, the greatest photo mystery on the cover of the Civil War Monitor uh, this month about which I have stuff to say. Uh, so here is the 50th Pennsylvania spread out somewhere near Culp's Hill as in association with the dedication of the cornerstone for the Soldiers National Cemetery. You can see the 50th, you see their colonel over there, there's some civilians over there. We have two different pictures of it which is cool, and if you zoom into the glass plate, you can see some very distinctive rocks in the background there. We should be able to find this. Even in the main photo, you can see a couple of semi-distinctive rocks over there. We should be able to find it. And then the photographer also took two photos of the officers of that group, and some of these civilians as well. Um, and there, there's those same boulders that we should be able to locate. There's enough to stick there, and they're pretty big. Um, and here's some of the officers. There's the colonel, there's the hero of Gettysburg, John Burns. Pretty cool. Um, there's some of those same civilians and everything. And then right next to their feet over there is a, a distinctive rock with a nice little crack in it right there. We know exactly how big it is because it would come up to a you know a shortish man, shins or something. I'll say I'm John Burns' is height shortish or something like that. And you know, we've been trying to find it. And just yesterday someone texted me, James, you're not here, are you? He said, he said, how do you like this one? He sends me pictures of little rocks and says, how do you like this one? How do you like that one? <laughs> you know, I want to find this one, because I think it'll lead to finding the other one as well. It's a twofer, um, but to no avail. So um, this is just an introduction of the 350 slides I wanted to show you to talk about the fighting at the Rocky Bulwark, to talk a little bit about the, uh, the names for the rocks, the mysteries of the rocks, and everything that's cool about rocks at Gettysburg. One soldier at Gettysburg actually said that he was, uh, or he was writhing in the hospital, and somebody wrote that he was trying to talk to him, who are you, where are you from, and all he could say was about those awful, awful rocks. <laughs> Maybe that's how they used it for John Bell Hood in the Gettysburg movie. So, Thank you so much for, for uh, listening to me spot on about one of my favorite subjects. Get inspired at battlefields.org. Support the National Civil War Museum. And I'll be glad to take any questions you have before I go out and sign books. Woo!